Goed. Hello. Hello everybody. Um, welcome to our webinar on World Arthritis Day. We will uh, give you two minutes to uh, join the webinar and then we will start with the introduction. So waiting for the attendees to join our meeting room. We have a lot of uh, interest uh, for our course. And um, so we are waiting one, uh, one minute or more to let everybody um, start the Zoom client and uh, join our webinar. So just for your information, this uh, webinar is uh, live streamed uh, on YouTube and is also recorded. So in case you have to go, there will be a recording uh, afterwards. And uh, also to let you know that your uh, chat messages, uh, they are not appearing in, this, in, the, uh, in the recording, but uh, when we answer your questions, of course, this will be recorded. Okay, so welcome everybody. My name is Kai Herman. I'm a radiologist from, um, from Berlin and uh, I'm, uh, doing this webinar together with my two colleagues, Thorsten Diekhoff and Dennis Podubny, and also Eva Reidemeister from our team is joining us today. The purpose of this webinar is to uh, 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 raise awareness for uh, early diagnosis of arthritis, and also to uh, give you some hints on how to tackle uh, uh, problems with patients that are suspected to have early arthritis, which imaging, imaging methods can be applied, and um, which different uh, types of arthritis are there, and um, how, we, uh, how we use X-ray, CT, and MRI, and even ultrasound to, um, to go on with these patients. So this... Um, this uh, online course is intended to, to last for about one hour. There will be three lectures uh, presented. And after these three lectures, we will have a Q&A session. So your uh, questions, you can um, write them down. Uh, we have um, two options uh, to, to learn, know about your questions. The first option is the Q&A button. That is somewhere here down below. Uh, and this Q&A button might also be translated into your local language. So in German, this is an F and A button, for instance. And this is uh, the, the place where you can enter your question. And this will be uh, uh, in a list that we can answer these questions one by the other and will facilitate our discussion. You can also use the, uh, the chat box um, to ask questions and uh, we will try to capture those as well. And the chat box can also be used to ask questions um, uh, for technical aspects of this webinar. And we will also provide you links to our three cases that we are presenting today in the chat box. So watch out for the chat box. Usually this new chat then pops up on the screen and you can click on it if you want to use the link on your computer. Okay, so... Uh, these links to the cases, I'm briefly presenting them on my phone. This is an interactive case uh, presentation system called Berlin Case Viewer. And um, this, uh, with this tool, you can, you can uh, use the, the slider bar down below here to use the images. You can uh, click on the images and uh, scroll through uh, all the MRI slices. And you can also enlarge and get additional information about the cases, so just that you know what these links are for that we are sending you uh, shortly. Okay, so let us um, start with the fun part. And it's my pleasure to um, introduce uh, my colleague from the rheumatology department, Dennis Podubny. He's the head of rheumatology at uh, the campus Benjamin Franklin at the Charité University Medicine in Berlin. 
And he has a profound knowledge in axial spondyloarthritis, not only on the clinical grounds, but also on the imaging aspects of the disease. So he's the right person to present you uh, uh, clinical aspects and imaging features of the disease. And welcome, Dennis. Please start your lecture. Thank you very much, Kai, uh, dear colleagues. It's really a great pleasure to be uh, today with you. And thank you very much, Kai, for this great initiative for organizing this event. I, I think this is extremely important. And um, um, the um, uh, event today uh, highlights also a need for a deep collaboration between um, rheumatologists, um, um, orthopedic surgeons, and uh, radiologists uh, who are helping to, to make the diagnosis of the disease where imaging is really required. I'm starting with, with a disease called nowadays XL spondyloarthritis. Here you see my um, disclosures in a second. Yeah, um, I, I think only the uh, um, two in the bottom are really relevant to be being a member of two professional societies dealing with um, with the inflammatory disease. So what is axial spondyloarthritis? Uh, it's in, in, in fact, this is a new name for the disease uh, um, formerly known as ankylosing spondylitis or in German-speaking countries, uh, Morbus Bechtreff, Bechtreff's disease. And um, the ch need for to, to change the name uh, came from, from the change, from the shift in a typical clinical presentation of those patients. So 50 years ago, the typical case of ankylosing spondylitis looked like this. So it was rather mid-aged male patient with already established structural damage in the spine resulting into ankylosis and sacroiliac joints in the spine. Nowadays, we are facing completely different uh, patient type and we see young male female patient, this is a, by, by the way, a patient of mine, you, you, you see that despite having a severe inflammatory disease and uh, what you see on uh, animation is a, a, a follow-up after eight years, some sy symptom onset, we, we, we see young male and female patients coming to us with just back pain. And it is extremely important um, um, to uh, diagnose the disease early, but also not to overdiagnose the disease that is, uh, uh, this risk is especially high uh, when we see those um, young people coming to us without structural damage. I will show you a couple of frequently asked questions and we'll try to give also answers to those questions. And the first question is, is it possible to diagnose excel spondylarthritis without imaging? The answer to this uh, question is very simple. Yes, it, it's it's possible. We, we, we can make the diagnosis cumulatively based on, on the entire amount of the clinical features uh, which are there. But if we're talking about really axial spondylarthritis where inflammation is localized in sacroiliac joints in the spine and we don't have imaging, then the purely clinical diagnosis would be always less certain than the diagnosis based on imaging findings or supported by imaging findings. Um, this is different in rheumatoid arthritis. In rheumatoid arthritis, normally we can diagnose arthritis clinically, cirrhotic arthritis, the same. But in exospondyl arthritis, there are no reliable um, tests to um, find out whether patient symptoms, back pain is really related to inflammation or not. I will show you an, an example and I will guide you th through this case. And this is this will be um, the uh, basis for the discussion of imaging techniques. Um, this is a young female patient, 28 years old, who came to us with inflammatory back pain. Um, you see uh, characteristics of inflammatory back pain, pain at night, morning stiffness for more than th 30 minutes, improvement with exercise, no improvement with rest for approximately eight years. I need to say already here that inflammatory back pain doesn't mean that there is inflammation behind this. It could be also mechanical problem. It could be degenerated disc, it could be osteitis condensans ili, 
but inflammatory back pain is a very important screening parameter so young persons with chronic inflammatory back pain they should be checked for the presence of inflammatory disease such as axial spondyloarthritis so she she had no full dose of NSAIDs so far, so we cannot say whether NSAIDs were helpful or not. No peripheral or extramuscular skeletal manifestations. The, there was a family history of psoriasis. HLAB27 was positive and CRP was uh, slightly elevated. So based on this clinical presentation, we can only say that um, the probability of axial spondylarthritis is there it, it, it is rather high but normally we need an objective confirmation of, of the presence of inflammation in sacroiliac joints and, uh, or in the spine and that is why we use imaging as a part of the diagnostic approach if you scan this QR code you will uh, get directly to this case to the uh, Berlin case you were with all the images uh, which were presented by uh, Kai Gad, and um, you can you can f uh, continue you can follow the discussion um, um, uh, looking at at those uh, images uh, in a real time. When we talk about imaging for um, excel spondylarthritis, uh, there is a set of Euler recommendations for um, use of imaging in patients with suspected excel SPA, and here you see 2015. The recommendation, the first recommendation here, is um, that a conventional X-ray should be should be done first if if you su suspect um, XL spondylarthritis, conventional X-ray of sacroiliac joints. Uh, this has been performed in this case, and what you what you see here, you see some structural changes. You see some subchondral sclerosis on both sides, and you see something which might be a um, uh, so-called widening or pseudo-widening of both joint spaces, but uh, those changes are rather un unreliable. The, um, the um, uh, reliability of uh, uh, radiographic sacroiliac assessment is in general very low, and uh, that is why there is one of the quite common questions, should, uh, should we always perform X-rays? First, and the, uh, um, the answer to this question is that more and more publications questioning the usefulness of the X-rays of sacroiliac joints in the diagnostic approach related to XL SPA. And one of those works uh, came uh, from the collaboration with uh, uh, Thorsten Dickhoff and Kai Gerd Hermann, uh, where we looked at uh, imaging sets from 163 patients and we evaluated those images uh, um, in five reading sessions so we looked separately at x-rays at mris at ct combination of mri with x-ray and combination of mri and ct and here you see the results first x-ray is as you see neither very sensitive sensitivity of only about 66 percent nor very specific the specificity is only about 70 percent if you look at imaging modality with the highest level of uh, specificity that would be ct if you look for imaging method with the highest level of sensitivity that would be an mri and this is well, uh, how we deal with, with this with the situation in the in a daily clinical practice normally if we don't have um um, definite radiographic sacroiliitis, we go straight to MRI and then we look for um, active inflammatory and structural changes on MRI. Um, very important question for daily clinical practice, uh, which MRI sequences should be performed in the case of suspicion of excel spondylarthritis? And um, ideally, you, you need three sequences to depict active inflammatory and structural changes reliably. This EULA, there was a presentation on international consensus for standardized uh, imaging acquisition protocol for sacroiliac joints. And the bottom line of this uh, are those um, uh, four sequences. And in fact, these are three sequences in, in, in two planes. So we, we have semicoronal plane with T1-weighted sequence, with T2-weighted sequence, with head suppression, such as STIR, and 
one special sequence uh, uh, which is erosion uh, sensitive and we have in addition to this another inflammation sensitive t2 weighted sequence in the semi axial plane to depict also posterior elements of the sac of the sacroiliac joints here you see those planes so uh, this is the standard so called semi coronal plane with this plane you you, you can depict the entire sacroiliac joints with a minimal number of slices and perpendicular to this is a semi axial plane here you you can depict um, a retroarticular space very well next question is what do i need to see on mri to be sure that this is axial spondylarthritis and um, the question nowadays is that normally you need a combination of active inflammatory but also structural changes because we learned that bone marrow edema alone is not a very uh, specific finding so bone marrow edema can be induced by um, uh, mechanical stress and um, the way how to increase the specificity of bone marrow edema is to look also at structural changes so let's start with um, um, water sensitive or inflammation sensitive sequence this is semicoronal to do with fat suppression or stir sequence and what you see here is indeed presence of subchondral bone marrow edema localized bilaterally in this case however if you look at um, anterior portion of the joint you see that bone marrow edema is quite prominent there and localization of bone marrow edema in the very anterior portion of the joint is uh, um, rather something we, we we observe quite frequently in patients with mechanically induced problems and that is why it would be really um, important to have a look at uh, T1-weighted sequence. But first, uh, it's a semi axial plane where you see that indeed bone marrow edema is localized uh, mostly in the ventral part, but also in the mid part of the joint. And now uh, T1-weighted sequence where we look um, at um, uh, structural changes and they are they are present there uh, you have, you have uh, fatty metaplasia of the bone marrow you have sclerosis you have erosions and you have even backfill signs of this fat within the erosion cavity it's a repair tissue repairing the erosion to be sure that we're we're dealing here indeed with erosions you need an erosion sensitive uh, sequence and uh, it is it is present uh, there uh, um, we use so-called wipe sequence volumetric interpolated breath hold examination the generic term for those sequences is, is a 3d uh, gradient echo sequence and um, um, uh, I would I would uh, uh, only recommend you to talk to your uh, radiologist to implement uh, that kind of sequence in your standard protocol because you see the presence of erosions really uh, greatly on those sequences and this is very well com uh, comparable with uh, what you can expect on CT from those patients uh, CT was performed in this case independently of our diagnostic approach so we can compare MRI with CT and here you see that wipe sequence depicted erosions to the same extent as CT is uh, doing and there was uh, uh, recently also a publication on this comparing uh, wipe MRI with CT and as, as you can see there was a great agreement between MRI and CT in fact uh, uh, we don't need uh, CT anymore uh, as uh, uh, if, if we have um, uh, properly performed um, MRI of sacroiliac joints so I have a couple of take-home messages for you so the diagnostic workup in patients with suspicion of axial spondylarthritis includes proper use and in the, in, in the rotation of imaging uh, MRI is a method of objective detection of active inflammatory and post-inflammatory structural changes bone marrow edema can be induced by mechanical stress and to increase the specificity of MRI findings you need to look at both active inflammatory and structural changes the specificity of bone marrow edema is always higher in the presence of structural changes especially in the presence of erosions now as you saw t2 weighted sequ uh, sequence uh, such as stir and t1 weighted sequence are normally sufficient and wipe sequence or another 3d uh, gradient echo sequence 
are very helpful in detection of erosions. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, that's uh, it for the axial spondylarthritis part, and I give back to Kai. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, it's a wonderful case, and uh, you selected one that uh, shows uh, some changes that we expect in early disease and also uh, highlighted uh, changes that we are that we can expect uh, in the course of the disease. So um, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, as I said in the beginning, the discussion and questions will be handled after the third lecture. So uh, now it's my uh, part to, um, to share my screen. Uh, I'm a radiologist focusing on, um, on all sorts of arthritis and um, working for more than two decades at the Charité University Medicine. And uh, as such, um, I'm also happy to uh, um, uh, do a lot of research. Uh, in, in recent times, I'm doing more of interactive teaching. So Thorsten, who will be um, with us shortly, has overtaken the research part. And um, so I'm happy now to speak about rheumatoid arthritis, a disease that uh, is, is one of the most frequent uh, diseases in, in, in the uh, sphere of uh, uh, rheumatic diseases. So let's share my screen and hopefully it will work out. Um, okay. okay, so it's now today about uh, the different um, joint diseases. And here you see an example of, of, uh, uh, of, of 18 uh, different different joint uh, destructions and patterns. And of course, that is exactly the problem with uh, imaging of arthritis, that uh, people usually are very uh, uh, reluctant to, to deal with, with these uh, changes. To, 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 uh, they are reluctant to learn about arthritis because sometimes um, they think it's about old people and the diseases of the, of the elderly, which is certainly not the case as we have just learned. And also uh, these uh, things some, sometimes seem to be very difficult and to understand. And, and if you try to read them up, usually you, you, you end up in the bookshop or in the library getting, getting large books. So uh, that is maybe a reason uh, that people don't like uh, uh, this part uh, of musculoskeletal radiology. But I can say uh, in the beginning, it was the same for me, but um, you have to be clever and only uh, do um, distinct these uh, diseases into two groups, the inflammat inflammatory group and uh, the de degenerative group. And if you do that, then you have the first step. And uh, if you then understand the principles of inflammatory joint diseases compared to degenerative joint diseases, then um, it is very uh, easy to then step up and go to the uh, uh, to the uh, single diseases and to distinguish them in between the inflammatory group. So in um, in general, there are three different types of joint uh, uh, diseases distinguished um, in in the scope of of our topic of of joint diseases. And that is the uh, synovial-based disease, which is the prototype rheumatoid arthritis, which I will uh, present uh, today. And then there's another uh, type of diseases that is more antesial based That means the inflammation is not so much in the joint capsule, but is in the structures outside of the joint capsule, the ligamentous uh, uh, junctions, the ligaments, the joint capsules that uh, we call the antesis. And the typical disease uh, is psoriatic arthritis. And we will only today touch uh, very briefly about psoriatic arthritis. But you can see already from this uh, diagram that uh, much more inflammation seems to happen in psoriatic arthritis compared to rheumatoid arthritis because more structures are involved. And these two, uh, the inflammatory uh, the, uh, disease groups are um, are um, distinguished from the osteoarthritis group where we have a cartilage-based disease. So you can see that the cartilage in, in degenerative change, uh, diseases is, is the main focus of, uh, of, uh, of the um, pathologic process. 
the cartilage uh, is thinned out and uh, dur uh, during the thinning of the cartilage, all the other changes occur like the osteophytes and the cysts in the bone and uh, also secondary inflammation in the joint capsule. So today we will focus uh, solely on rheumatoid arthritis. In rheumatoid arthritis, the, uh, there is inflammation in the synovial lining of the, of the joint. And this, uh, this inflammation is called uh, 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 panus. Here you see in a uh, photograph of a panus of an, uh, in a knee joint as uh, the orthopedic surgeon did open the joint to take out all the uh, synovial proliferations. This was in the older times where there was open surgery compared to uh, arthroscopic surgery nowadays. And uh, it's exactly this area that is marked here in red. And uh, you see uh, that this uh, thin line is already uh, uh, thickened here and grows into the joint space. And then you have to, um, to know that uh, there is, a, 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 at the majority of joints, there are some parts of the bone uh, in, within the joint, but not covered with the cartilage. So there is a mismatch between the cartilage cover and the joint capsule attachment. And this uh, short area here is called the bare area. That means the area that is not covered by cartilage. And this is uh, a site where the panus can get into the bone very fast because in the other areas, the cartilage uh, has some uh, uh, protective, uh, protective uh, uh, features. So we, we, know, we know that the, the panus the panus grows into the bone, it destroys the bone. That is why arthritis is so uh, debilitating and, uh, and can, can lead to a lot of burden in daily life. And this panus is going into the joint. And because of the location of the spare area at the edge of the joint, also the uh, resulting bone destruction uh, is called uh, bone destruction is at the edge, but as we all are uh, doctors, we like to have difficult terms. So we call it marginal erosions. So these are erosions of the bone and they are at the margin of the joint. Therefore, they are called marginal erosions. So that is very typical for many forms of arthritis, especially for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, uh, a little bit also for psoriatic arthritis and uh, Torsten will later uh, give us some uh, insights if it's also the case in gout. And this pattern, this drawing here, can be translated very nicely into uh, the destruction pattern on, as, as that we see on X-ray, but can also be used to do interpretation of MRI. Here you see that the joint space is well preserved and that is, uh, can be expected because the cartilage is not, um, uh, is not part of the pathologic process in, in early and, and mid-stage disease. And we have this destruction of the bone at the edges of the, uh, of the joint. So this is a typical marginal erosion. Here you see it like uh, 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 it is drawn here as a defect, but also all of this here is a large erosion. And um, you see some uh, bony substance still, still here because we have uh, we have a three-dimensional uh, uh, bone and uh, we do a projection image. So um, we are not always able to see the erosion as a cutoff like here. So sometimes uh, you need to have a little bit of, uh, uh, of, of a three-dimensional thinking in order to really recognize the erosion. So there is one erosion here, a larger one there. Here are more erosions, two small erosions. Here this looks also. Uh, not not normal, and then we have smaller cystic lesions over here and smaller erosions are also there. So these are uh, three MCP joints from the hand, and this brings uh, me directly to the uh, the typical workup of uh, patients with rheumatoid uh, uh, with a suspicion of of any form of arthritis. Usually, uh, the recommendation is to perform X-ray images of the hand and feet as a set. So when the patient has suspicion for rheumatic disease and he's transferred to the radiological department, uh, usually four 
X-rays are performed, that is an X-ray of the right and the left hand and an X-ray of the right and the left foot. And if you do it uh, really good, you can do additional, additionally uh, uh, second planes, which are uh, oblique planes, like the uh, uh, oblique view and the hand is a so-called sitter player uh, position. And also at the foot, we have oblique uh, uh, views available. And here you see what we uh, quite frequently can encounter in our practice. We have quite good looking MCP joints of a patient with early arthritis. And that was also the reason why uh, she presented to the outpatient department. And we have destruction in the uh, uh, metatarsophalangeal joints, in the MTP joints, that you see here on the little toe on both, uh, both sides and also on other toes. And um, this is uh, frequently the case because the feet are not so much uh, uh, used in, in terms of single movements of joints than the hands. And therefore people forget about pain in the feet and, and are more prone to report their pain in the hands. So sometimes the disease is already more advanced at the feet. There is also the, um, uh, the, the term of cysts. So uh, in, in our practice, we report a lot of cysts. Here we have this little cystic change in the third MCP joint that's hard to see. I guess uh, if you are new to the field, you wouldn't uh, see, it. see it. If you do an oblique view, you can see nicely here this lucency with a small uh, sclerotic rim. And uh, these uh, changes are in 50% of the cases already erosive changes. So these are two different patients. Both have these cystic changes. Uh, both in the AP view and also in the oblique view. And uh, the upper one uh, uh, was an erosion already with destruction of the bone on a CT scan and uh, the lower one wasn't. So this is very uh, difficult to tell. So if you see these patterns, you, we would recommend to do additionally ultrasound or MRI in order to check if there are erosions uh, evident. So this is all about early changes uh, on X-ray. We will sp later speak also about uh, early changes on, um, on, on, on MRI. And now I'm coming for a short moment, moment also to late changes. So this is obviously a patient with uh, more than uh, 20 years of uh, disease duration. You see uh, what happens if, the, if treatment cannot be done um, uh, in a good way or if treatment is, is, is not available. So this is an X-ray that uh, I acquired 20 years ago when there were uh, no uh, biological uh, DMARDs available. And you see what happens if this arthritis is untreated. We have ankylosis. That means we have fusing of the bones. And uh, so these eight carpal bones, they fuse together and even fuse with the uh, with the, with the radius. Similar here, we have a, a, a joints cleft still seen, but mostly this is all ossified and we call it the os carpale. Uh, at the finger joints, we have usually the typical deviation of the axis of the joint. So the typical deviation is the ulnar deviation. That means in the MCP joint, we have an axis deviation and uh, it, uh, uh, it, it bends to the ulnar side. And then we have different types of uh, deformities of the fingers, like uh, this one neck deformity or the boutonniere, which will I not go into uh, uh, deeply uh, right now. So uh, let's, let's try to look at, at one interactive case. You can uh, use the link in the chat box, or you can also scan this code. Um, but you can also decide uh, not to uh, uh, do it now. You can do it later. And I demonstrate uh, 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 our case in uh, uh, right now in a, for a short uh, moment of time. So you see that um, here we have a patient. Uh, she's uh, 70, 72 years of age. And uh, and uh, uh, one question is: Is my screen visible? 
Is my screen visible? Yes, I see. Yes. I think so. Okay, sorry. So here we see uh, this is uh, this patient has uh, uh, X, uh, we obtained X rays of both both hands. Usually we we try to look at uh, at both uh, X rays together. So we need uh, some kind of workstation which allows. Uh, both images together. We do not recommend using one X-ray of both hands because that uh, re uh, results in a uh, inferior image quality. And if you uh, if you now uh, think about uh, what I said about the marginal erosions, we can check if there are erosions visible here or if there are cystic changes. I think the the carpal bones look nice, and here we see the joint space looks nice. The the contours of the bone look good. And uh, checking the same on the uh, on the other side, we are not sure. Uh, so erosions, they are definitely not there, but maybe there are some small uh, cystic changes over here. Okay, so let's um, let's go back to the presentation, and we will uh, now uh, check on the options that we have to detect early changes. So the problem is. Radiography is not really a good thing for early disease. So these are three different patients with three different diseases in its early stage. So this is early rheumatoid arthritis, early psoriatic arthritis, and early osteoarthritis. And the only difference that can be seen is maybe a little bit of demineralization in the patient with osteoarthritis, but otherwise there are uh, more or less similar uh, appearances, maybe there are some deviation here of the axis of the third finger, and also maybe some cystic change in the styloid process of the ulna, but these are very subtle changes and uh, they are not sufficient to make the diagnosis. What we uh, like to do for early diagnosis uh, is to use two different imaging modalities. One is ultrasonography and the other is MRI. Both methods uh, 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 can be used interchangeably in most of the time. So uh, here are uh, typical uh, patterns uh, of tenosynovitis uh, at the carpal region. We, we can, uh, in this ultrasound, uh, uh, make the, uh, the uh, vasculature uh, uh, visible with uh, power Doppler sonography and, and can estimate the burden of, son uh, of synovitis. And we also see the, the, the contour of the bone if we can access it with a probe and can see erosions at MCP joints and also PIP joints and at the wrist in most times. With MRI, it's, it's more or less uh, similar. Uh, we have a, a little bit more technical um, uh, 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 considerations in order because we need a very expensive device. People are very uncomfortably in the in the MRI tunnel, and and uh, also we like to uh, inject gadolinium in most of the times for to image the hands. But you can see nicely tenosynovitis, also very small amounts of tenosynovitis. You can see synovitis, and what's an advantage of MRI over uh, sonography is the depiction of bone marrow edema. And bone marrow edema, as you see it here. And also in in the in the other carpal bones might be a sign for a worse prognosis. So um, it is important to capture bone marrow edema. Erosions, on the other hand, are similarly good to be seen on the uh, on the MRI scan. Here's uh, here are some more uh, different uh, changes that you can see, uh, like with gadolinium enhanced scans, we see synovitis, and also the panos usually grows into the into the erosions and uh, you can only remember what I said about the disease. So in the marginal area, we see the ingrowth of panus. So that is a very typical pattern of, uh, uh, of rheumatoid arthritis, bone marrow edema, I already mentioned. And in, in cases like psoriatic arthritis, we see also the inflammation outside the joint at the periosteum and at the out outside of the joint capsule. So differential diagnosis, um, can be done uh, with MRI, but it's not the method of choice. The method of choice for differential diagnosis is in fact uh, a combination of, uh, of, of the clinical picture of X-ray and of uh, MRI. So you need more uh, pieces of the puzzle, puzzle in order to come to a good end. 
Um, here we have good examples of joint uh, inflammation, of extra capsular inflammation, and, and of uh, uh, subchondral inflammation in degenerative joint disease. But these are uh, rarely that we see it so clear. Usually, many diseases are presenting with, um, with synovitis. And then uh, the differential diagnosis, uh, the list of differential diagnoses is rather broad. Here we see a patient with severe uh, synovitis. And uh, uh, without the X-ray, you would not see that there are multiple um, multiple uh, classifications in the wrist, and also there's uh, uh, scaphalunite uh, dissociation. So um, this is uh, not uh, a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, but it's a patient with CPPD or chondrocalcinosis. Okay, so for a brief moment, uh, uh, I will uh, show you the MRI. Um, uh, features of our case. We'll start also the uh, sharing of the screen again. Okay. So now um, we see the uh, case again that uh, we saw on X-ray and we will go further to, to watch our uh, MRI changes. MRI has the advantage that we have multiple slices and we can, we can see that each slice represents two to three millimeters of, um, of, uh, of the bone. And therefore, we have a, a very good uh, uh, three-dimensional depiction of, of these changes. And, uh, but on the other hand, we also need a workstation in order to go to the through the slices. So here we see there is some, uh, some signal change in the bone. That does not look normal. And here we have also the destruction from the side of the bone, which we call marginal erosion. Also, there is thickening of the joint capsule. That can be uh, seen also on the water sensitive uh, sequence, which is in this case a steer sequence. So we see in the bone the change and also in the uh, joint capsule, as we see it here. Uh, with uh, three millimeter slice thickness is, is rather thick. And also we have a lot of bone marrow edema visible in the wrist and the basis of the metacarpal bones. So this is um, a patient who is at risk for uh, progressive destruction. And uh, usually after gadolinium injection, we see uh, all the synovitis uh, turning out bright on these fat saturated images and uh, it's, it's uh, uh, very impressive, I have to say, how destroyed the bone already is. If you see exactly this slice, we have very intense synovitis, and we have this large erosion, which goes into the bone, and we could only see um, this small cystic change here on the X-ray. That is only the only thing we could see. So this is um, just to highlight the advantage of advanced imaging, being it MRI or being it sonography. Uh, coming to the end, uh, I just want to highlight that different diseases manifest at different joints. Rheumatoid arthritis manifests at PIP joints, uh, which are proximal interphalangeal joints, metacarpal uh, phalangeal joints, and the uh, uh, Ulna, the, the styloid process of the ulna. In uh, osteoarthritis, we have a predominance of the uh, DIP, the distal interphalangeal joints, but there are, uh, are also forms that affect the proximal interphalangeal joints and the thumb of the base. In uh, psoriatic arthritis, we have also DIP joint uh, involvement, but also involvement of entire fingers. So that is uh, special about psoriatic arthritis. We will come to that in another uh, course and uh, chondrocalcinosis and uh, CPPD are manifesting mostly at the MCP joints, but predominantly at the wrist and uh, similar for gout, but I will not go into gout uh, here because this will then be covered by uh, my colleague Torsten. Okay, going to the uh, final slide. So I, um, I already uh, demonstrated you uh, the different patterns of diseases. And I think the sh in this short time, I could sh show you how the, 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 the essence of inflammation takes place and how it destroys the bone. 
and uh, I, I briefly also discussed what happens in osteoarthritis. And if you can distinguish the inflammation type pattern from the osteoarthritis type pattern, you can already make two different piles of diseases and, and group them. And then there are only some of them who are not belonging to any one of the two groups that uh, require your special reading in, in, the, in the large textbooks. But that can be done later in the next uh, stage. Okay, to summarize uh, my lecture, I think it is important to, to not only know the, the imaging findings, but also to understand the uh, processes that are there to make these findings and to understand them because uh, uh, then you can translate these changes to all the imaging modalities. MRI and ultrasound are uh, the two methods that can be used for early detection, but sometimes they are non-specific and only uh, uh, have, uh, have their value if X-ray is available. And therefore, uh, I like X-ray to uh, use patient, uh, to to use imaging of of our patients with arthritis. And I hope I uh, uh, could transfer my uh, uh, passion also to you in this lecture. Thank you very much. Okay, then um, I think we are on time to start with the lecture. By my colleague Thorsten. Thorsten uh, is uh, uh, assistant professor for radiology uh, in our department and leads the research group on musculoskeletal imaging and has a special focus also on uh, CT, computer tomography. And therefore, he's the right person to report about crystal disease. Thorsten. Yes, thank you, Kai. Um... I'm happy to share uh, or to talk with you a little bit about uh, crystal arthropathies. And there are, of course, more than three crystal arthropathies, but those three that I want to uh, discuss with you today uh, are certainly the most common. Gouty arthritis, even more common than uh, excess bundle arthritis or um, rheumatoid arthritis in the Western countries. So I thought it would be nice to directly start uh, with a case. So if you scan the QR code down here, you can uh, also look um, at the images by yourself. But I present you the main, the, the most uh, important slices and discuss with you a little bit the imaging findings. So what we see here is a knee x-ray of a construction worker with knee pain and uh, he went to the orthopedic surgeon um, with his knee pain and the orthopedic surgeon performed an x-ray. And what we can see here is perhaps some soft tissue swelling um, also here in front of the knee. And if you look uh, closely, you might, uh, might tend to see that there are some faint opacities inside of the soft tissue swelling. So the orthopedic colleague was uh, not so sure how to, how to handle this patient. Um, he was, in fact, he was already planned for knee replacement. You see it on, uh, uh, because of this, of this reference body here. Um, but then we said, okay, perhaps we should do another imaging technique. And he uh, referred this patient to the MRI scan. And this is what you see in the MRI, this is the T1 weighted sequence you see the soft tissue swelling here surrounding the joint. This is uh, hyper intense in the uh, PD fat set uh, sequence. And when you administer contrast medium, you see that the soft tissue swelling enhances with contrast application. So there's a lot of inflammation uh, in this knee joint and surrounding the knee joint. However, what you have to know is that MRI has always difficulties to depict uh, crystal depositions because they do not give direct signal in the MRI scan. So uh, we need some other imaging techniques to uh, prove our suspicion here, which should be uh, perhaps gouty arthritis when you see such an image. And uh, I will present you the three possible alternatives that you could go in such a patient to prove that this patient has gouty arthritis by using imaging and not by using arthrosynthesis, so a joint uh, aspiration, which you of course could also do. 
So the first thing that I want to show you is um, the ultrasound. This is the, the same patient. You see here in the ultrasound that there is a, a faint a hyperechoic soft tissue deposition here at the uh, lateral femoral condyle. Uh, the patient has also an erosion, which is also visible in the MRI scan, of course. So this is already direct proof of crystal deposition and a quite nice sign that this patient has. So if you flex the knee and look at the femoral cartilage, you see here a so-called double contour sign. So you see a bright hyperechoic line on top of the cartilage, then you see a hyper or unechoic cartilage uh, below this line, and then you see a second line, which is the uh, bony interface. So this so-called double contour sign is quite specific for gouty arthritis, because what you see here as a hyperechoic line is in fact um, uric acid crystals inside the joint space, uh, like a lawn on the cartilage. Ultrasound, of course, has also some advantages compared to uh, other imaging modalities. So for example, it has a very high spatial resolution. Um, look here at the same region in the radiograph. Um, the erosion is quite hard to see from superposition. You see it very nicely in the ultrasound. Of course, you see it also in, also in the CT scan, but the resolution of this uh, erosion also of the soft tissue deposition is much lower compared to ultrasonography. Here would be an other example of a big toe with a patient with gouty arthritis. You see here some uh, soft tissue deposition, so gouty tophus. You see also an erosion, and this is really, really hard to see in uh, the CT scan because the spatial resolution is not so high. Of course, CT has some advantages uh, compared to ultrasound. So CT is a very fast imaging technique that is very standardized and that can also see uh, uric acid crystals, for example, here in the tendon or in the bursa, or here the trophus near the femoral condyle. And when you use a special CT technique, which is called dual energy CT, you can directly characterize those crystal depositions and see that this is, yes, this is gouty arthritis, this is uric acid deposition, which is highlighted here in different colors. And what you can also do with the CT scan, of course, is you can scan uh, multiple joint, joints in a short amount of time and assess the trophus burden of the patient quite comprehensively. And of course, use also this information for follow-up. So computer tomography or dual energy computer tomography would be a second way to prove that there is a gouty crystal deposition. And the last way that I want to present you is uh, radiography. So of course, gouty arthritis is not a uh, disease that affects only one joint. So of course, we have those typical cases where there is um, uh, trophus and erosion and uh, pain and, soft and, and swelling of the big toe, um, the first MTP joint. But of course, when it is a uh, uh, long-standing gouty arthritis, and perhaps a complicated disease. We have also other joints that are affected. And when you uh, do the x-ray of the hands and feet, you have a lot of joints where you can see those, those soft tissue depositions a little bit better compared to the knee x-ray that I have presented uh, a few minutes ago. And you can also see those nice erosions that are typical for gouty arthritis. So this patient here, as a well delineated erosion with overhanging edges, which is quite characteristic for the presence of gout. Um, so, if you want to establish the diagnosis of gouty arthritis, you have several options uh, to do that. Uh, for example, uh, you see typical erosions in x ray, you can see the um, monosodium uric acid crystals by joint aspiration. Uh, which you can do uh, with ultrasound guidance, for example. You can see the depositions using dual energy CT, or you see the double control sign or trophus um, with, um, with the ultrasound. And the imaging modality that I have not mentioned so far is uh, MRI, because MRI is usually not very specific for those crystal depositions. So in MRI, you will see some inflammation like here, at the elbow, you see some inflammation 
uh, because the tophus is in the periphery quite hypervascularized, but you cannot see those crystal depositions directly. So I would recommend when you are in doubt, if this is gout, uh, switch to another imaging modality. Here's a short overview. Um, from my experience, so certainly the most sensitive imaging technique is ultrasound because you see this double contour sign and also have the advantage of the high spatial resolution. And perhaps the most specific imaging modality is dual energy CT, which you could also use for follow-up. What dual energy CT can also do is to characterize those crystal depositions. So we have here two patients that have wrist pain and both patients show um, soft tissue calcifications in the ligaments of, um, the, of the wrist. And we perform dual energy CT for both uh, those patients and the dual energy CT shows that only one patient has uric acid de uh, crystal depositions and the other patient has calcium containing crystal depositions. So this patient here has a different disease that we call calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease or CPPD. And patients with CPPD can present with really severe acute arthritis, uh, like in this patient that uh, was scanned uh, uh, in the emergency room, uh, where you see a vast amount of uh, bone marrow edema and synovitis. And again, here the MRI has difficulties to see those faint crystal depositions that are uh, well established in, in uh, radiography. So if you have uh, only the MRI scan and you have the suspicion that the patient has perhaps some other thing like uh, as, as uh, rheumatoid arthritis, so a crystal uh, deposition disease you should uh, use a, radio, a radiography or CT scan or some photon-based imaging to prove uh, your suspicion. And CPPD comes in five different flavors. So we have asymptomatic uh, calcifications of uh, the cartilage that is quite common in elderly uh, peoples. So just because there are crystals present uh, does not uh, establish the diagnosis or so the patient should have uh, the corresponding uh, clinical uh, symptoms. Um, we have the acute inflama uh, inflammatory form of CPPD, which we can also call pseudogout. This is the patient that I just presented on a slide before. Uh, we have the chronic inflammatory type of CPPD, uh, which we can also call pseudo rheumatoid arthritis. Um, this was probably the patient that um, uh, Kai showed you uh, a few uh, in, in the last presentation. And we have a chronic destructive form, which looks like this here. So you have uh, perhaps a patient with a few clinical uh, symptoms. And um, this patient here has the typical calcifications. He has um, a scaphalinite uh, ligament tear and also a corresponding osteoarthritis of the wrist. So this would be most likely a chronic destructive form. And then we have also a tophaceous form where the CPPD crystals form tophi, just like in gouty arthritis. CPPD crystals can also be detected by ultrasound. So this is the same patient with the crystals here in the TFCC where, it's, where they are typically uh, localized. And here in the ultrasonography, you see a longitudinal uh, longitudinal proposition of the TFCC where you can see also those crystal depositions. So uh, ultrasound is also a very good imaging technique um, for the peripheral joints uh, in search for CPPD. And this here is a nice patient, uh, or a nice case of a patient with a tophaceous um, CPPD where you see those crystal depositions here in the palma uh, wrist which you can see also by ultrasound and this patient presented uh, with carpal tunnel syndrome because uh, the carpal tunnel um, is here compressed by the stopacious CPPD um, depositions. By gouty arthritis, CPPD can affect many joints. Um, it is uh, off or sometimes seen uh, in the upper cervical spine where you can have the crown dense syndrome. Um, you can also see it as sternoclavicular joints or perhaps in the knee joint. And in the knee joint, you can have two different types of uh, calcification. So 
the, the meniscal calcification, which is probably not very specific, but when you see those calcifications here of the cartilage, which extend above the mid part of the joint, then you are quite sure that this is in fact CPPD depositions. Coming to the last uh, disease that I briefly want to talk uh, about, this was a young female patient presenting with acute knee pain and the MRI shows inflammation of the soft tissues and also the inflammation of um, the bone marrow. And you have to look very, very closely to see that there are some faint hyper intense uh, signal here uh, in the mid parts of the soft tissue uh, inflammation. And uh, this is well depicted in the CT scan where you see that there is some calcification which extends into uh, the bone. And this calcification causes, um, causes this inflammation. And you know it perhaps from the shoulder joints uh, where we call it calcific tendinitis and where it's most common in the supraspinatus tendons. What you can do as a radiologist uh, when you have a, such a patient with acute pain, you can try to treat this calcification by just simply sticking ultra, in, under ultrasound guidance a needle inside this deposition. This is a shoulder joint. And when you are inside this soft tissue deposition, you can uh, give a little bit um, silane solution in a positive manner. And you see in the first uh, few seconds, it moves a little bit, this calcification um, after um, after a few uh, minutes, you see that it moves a little bit more. And um, after about two, three minutes, um, you have uh, effectively removed those crystals uh, inside the tendon and they were flushed back, back into your syringe. So this is an effective way to treat those patients if they have an acute, um, uh, an acute calcific tendinitis. Um, those crystals are hydroxyapatite uh, crystals. So we call this disease hydroxyapatite deposition disease. And uh, those crystals usually form inside of tendons or ligaments. And uh, as, uh, as I said, you can remove them with uh, ultrasound guidance, or you can sometimes just treat it, uh, uh, treat it uh, uh, symptom based and the crystals will uh, go away by themselves because they usually, um, they usually do the symptoms when they are within the resorption phase. Um, also, this uh, disease can manifest at several locations, at the wrist, at the hips, at the cervical spine. And uh, one location that is probably not so common is the manifestation within the discs um, of the spine. So here you see those black crystal depositions stretching into the bone, causing this vast inflammation. And of course, you should not mistreat this inflammation as bondylocytis, for example. But this is just a calcific tendinitis of the lumbar disc in this case. So what I wanted to show you is that there are some helpful imaging techniques when it comes to uh, crystal um, arthropathies. So radiography, for example, ultrasound or computer tomography. There are some, uh, uh, some, some imaging techniques like MRI that uh, will provide you with non-specific imaging findings where you have to guess uh, according to the localization of the findings and the clinical presentation of the patient that there is perhaps a crystal deposition disease happening. And you can use uh, CT techniques just uh, such as um, do energy CT or spectral imaging techniques to quantify uh, crystal depositions and use this for follow-up. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Thorsten. And uh, I'm... I just have to... Uh, where is this? Can you do it? Here we go. Is the screen gone already? No. It's ah, not. here. Okay. No. Yes, thank you, Thorsten, for this uh, for this talk. Uh, it was intended to be an introductory talk. It turned out to be the advanced uh, uh, overview. 
into a, a lot of diseases, but I was very uh, mean in my uh, uh, in my planning. As I, Dennis and I only had one disease, and you had uh, crystal arthropathies, which which are indeed many diseases. So, thank you. And it is uh, now time to ask uh, to answer the questions. Uh, I have to. Um, apologize uh, with the participants because Dennis Podupny obviously has already left our meeting due to other commitments. Uh, so, but I've seen he has extensively answered the question already uh, uh, with, uh, with typing it in. And so please, if there are uh, any questions still open, you can uh, raise your hand and then we will uh, switch on your microphone, you can ask or you uh, uh, ask your questions in the Q&A. There were some questions regarding the first uh, talk um, about uh, axial spondylar arthritis. Um, I, so far, I don't see questions regarding the uh, rheumatoid arthritis and crystal disease. So uh, if you want, uh, uh, take the time to, to ask. Also, I uh, have to say, we had the technical issue of uh, providing the links. So we are doing this for the first time today uh, as a live stream. And um, so uh, Eva was not uh, allowed to, to, to post the links. She had all the links, but due to configuration issues, these links didn't make it to you, but now they are there. So you can uh, uh, use the links, uh, copy the links. And we will also tomorrow uh, send uh, an automatic email by. Uh, to all the attendees with the links or to the cases. And uh, so that is nothing that will be that will be lost. So you can uh, you can do that later on. And also we uh, we, we only we, we have also this app where we have provided now these cases as a module. And um, in this um, module in our apps, being it on the iPhone or the Android device. There are also interactive questions uh, included, so you have some uh, more intense learning effect. The questions will be um, uh, provided during the next uh, two days. So today, if you download it today, then you have the cases to view, and later on we will update this module with the questions. So um, many of you uh, attended, that's very nice. I know in some parts of the world, there's a public uh, holiday today, for, uh, for example, in, in Brazil, as I've learned, and I see some people from Brazil here in the call, which is very nice. So uh, hello to Brazil. So any questions? If not, oh, there are three, three new ones. Uh, Eva, three new ones. Uh, should I read them? It was great to energy. Um, we often have patients with mixed disease patterns on X-ray on hand and feet. Do you often report X-rays when appropriate as having more than one pathology? Yes. Um, so you, usually our patients with rheumatoid arthritis, when they get older, they also have osteoarthritis. So um, they might have uh, rheumatoid arthritis on their MCP joints and wrist. And then the, in addition, they have uh, heberdine, uh, osteoarthritis of the DIP joint. So that is something that we report. Also, uh, in terms of CPPD, maybe Torsten, you can later uh, on say something. Um, sometimes it's clear, but some patients with long-standing rheumatoid arthritis can also develop uh, CPPD and later on have two diseases. Any comments from you, Torsten, regarding this? I think that uh, the mere presence of crystal depositions does not constitute the disease of uh, CPPD arthritis. So um, uh, you, you need, for example, a constellation of uh, rheumatoid arthritis being well treated over some years and then developing additional symptoms that perhaps fit to CPPD when you then see or prove the crystals that would be, uh, would be a certain circumstance where CPPD is, is more in focus. But uh, I think you should report the crystal depositions because there are some, some differential, differentially helpful findings, but uh, do not constitute the diagnosis of CPPD arthritis only based on the presence of crystal depositions. That would be perhaps too much. So we would say it's compatible with CPPD arthritis? Yeah. Okay. Sure. And um... one other question on do energy CT? 
So um, the, the participants say, uh, saw different color schemes. So the color schemes are uh, dependent on the vendor that you use for your dual energy CT uh, system. So uh, Siemens has green gout and blue uh, bone and so on. And uh, the vendor that uh, I used, so uh, Canon has a different color scheme with red or green. Uh, TOFI and and uh, no color scheme for the bone, so that depends. And you saw different uh, colors because I just divided green for the left side and uh, red for the right side, so that it had nothing to do with uh, the specific um, specific crystal depositions. So if they were color coded, they were gouty arthritis depositions, and uh, so TOFI and not CPVD or some, some something else. Okay, there's one question about early changes of rheumatoid arthritis in the knees. And if that is predominantly uh, narrowing the joint space in the lateral joint compartment. So um, I uh, think that is very unreliable to, uh, to, to judge on, uh, on any sort of arthritis solely based on joint space narrowing. I know in the, in the uh, large books, there's written if the joint space narrowing is, 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 is asymmetric, then it is more like an osteoarthritis because it's a weight bearing zone. And if it's a symmetric decrease, it's more of an arthritis type. Um, sometimes we can see it, but I think these uh, very delicate distinctions, they were done at times where there was no option to do ultrasound or MRI because these devices were not yet invented. So I would rather uh, uh, only rely on, on true signs uh, of arthritis, which, is, uh, which are arthritis, uh, which are erosions, and also, of course, later changes like mutilations and ankylosis. But I would be reluctant to, to rely a diagnosis of arthritis uh, on, on solely joint space narrowing and also solely on demineralization near to the, to the joint. This and also, these are, these are only secondary signs, but uh, they are not sufficient for the diagnosis. There are two other questions for you probably, Kai. So um, uh, the first is that um, usually there is an argument when you have in addition to uh, arthritis erosions, uh, hook-like osteophytes and calcification uh, at the correct point uh, in a patient that is, is not responsive to RA uh, therapies. Um, okay, let's answer this first part uh, first. So if you have erosions, but then also large osteophytes at the same joint, then of course it depends on the joint, uh, on, the, on, the, on the location of the joint, if it's an MCP joint or PIP joint, or if it's a wrist. But I would suggest uh, 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 and at the MCP joint, this is a typical pattern without seeing the image of, uh, of hemochromatosis or uh, CPPD, where you have this hook-like uh, 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 or teardrop osteophytes, large osteophytes with, with, uh, with calcifications. And as, as we have seen in these crystal disease, diseases, we have a lot of also synovitis coming up. And this synovitis then does what all sorts of synovitis do. They, uh, invade into the bone. So then we have erosion and osteophytes as a combination. And do you have a tip for distinguishing erosive osteoarthritis and uh, psoriatic arthritis uh, in the DIP joints? Do I have when a tip? There are no so psoriasis features on the skin. Um, so if, so I, the problem is I have seen patients who are only 50 years of age and already have a severe DIP osteoarthritis. So usually I would say the age would, would be a good thing to distinguish, but I tell you, this is really, really very difficult to distinguish psoriatic arthritis from osteoarthritis of the DIP joints. Uh, of course, you have this uh, seagull uh, sign. That means if you have like a, a central defect, like the, 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 the seagull on, on the beach, uh, if a central defect, that is typical for osteoarthritis with the large osteophytes at the side. And in psoriatic arthritis, you are rather expecting marginal erosions at the side or at one side. And um, in some of the cases, there is also this periosteal new bone formation. So we, maybe we make a, another webinar in, 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 in some months about psoriatic arthritis. 
but this is the most difficult ta uh, task to distinguish these two. And there would be also the question uh, when we stick to the peripheral joints, um, do you have a way to distinguish between rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis uh, without uh, looking at newborn formation or when there's no newborn formation present? Oh, that's, yeah, because in, in our practice, there is, there are in fact, uh, a, a large proportion of patients who are not showing the the, 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 the new bone formations and um, and also here it is it is not really possible i'm i'm sometimes writing in my report i'm listing the erosions and then down there especially if, if i don't have a follow-up if, if it's a first time patient in our department i'm saying it's compatible with inflammatory type of arthritis uh, either RA or psoriatic arthritis, because that has to be uh, sorted out on clinical grounds. If the patient has psoriasis, um, then uh, he, he will not have uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, so the rheumatologist will never diagnose a rheumatoid arthritis in a patient where the radiologist says this is typical for rheumatoid arthritis, if, if he, on the other hand, sees the patient and knows he has psoriasis of the skin, this will be automatically be psoriatic arthritis, irrespective of the lab test. If there are uh, ACPA antibodies or rheumatoid factor, it, it is always a psoriatic arthritis because the skin and the clinical inspection is, is very dominant in the differential diagnosis. Do you see it differently, Torsten, in, in your... No, no, I, I, I think uh, exactly the same. So you have perhaps some signs that you could use. So the distribution that you mentioned, so if the DIP joints are affected, you would probably not uh, say that this is rheumatoid arthritis, but rather that is psoriatic arthritis. And when you have a different imaging than x-rays, so if, if you have MRI or uh, ultrasound and you see that the enthesitis is predominantly present, you would also perhaps say that this is more likely psoriatic arthritis than rheumatoid arthritis. But this is really difficult um, when you have no, no new, new bone formation. New bone formation is probably the most specific sign of psoriatic arthritis, I would say. Yeah. And then we have a final question. Um, Actually, two. Second <laughs> final question. Um, <laughs> If, if ankylosing spondylitis and excess spondyloarthritis are the same, yes, they are the same. Uh, uh, that is uh, the same disease. It was renamed 12 years ago in order to overcome the, uh, the old term ankylosing spondylitis because it only captures the, the late spectrum of the disease. And also uh, in, now the disease can be treated much more effectively. So the scientific community thought it's uh, it's it's not good that patients Google for, for stiff patients because nowadays they don't get stiff. But this is probably the short question, uh, the short answer. The long answer would be that ankylosing spondylitis has radiographic changes on the X-ray because it's so defined. And excess spondyloarthritis is probably only MRI positive and the radiograph is negative. Is this correct? So ankylosing spondylitis would, would be uh, uh, modified yes. criteria yes. positive. Ankylosing spondylitis is, is, is radiographic changes. But in fact, we, we just treat them as the same disease. So uh, access spondyl arthritis is probably uh, catching more patients because uh, it can be diagnosed earlier. Thank you. And then Could there's a the final question. Like different stages of the same disease, maybe, or something like that. Why is that wrong? Yeah, that's probably a difficult question. So I think the experts are still arguing whether uh, non-radiographic excess arthritis, so excess arthritis without X-ray changes is really an early form of excess arthritis because those patients often show changes in MRI that show advanced structural damage. It's just not visible in radiography. So this I recently had an, an interview with, with Joachim Sieper, who, who is uh, one of the best rheumatologists knowing about ankylosis and spondylitis and so on. And he uh, always proposes to uh, don't do the distinction between the two terms and, and treat all the patients at, uh, as the same. Yes. 
Thorsten, final question. If it is the final question, is for you, and uh, I can relate to that question. How do we do CPPD protocols with DEC, and do we also get color, uh, uh, or do we don't get color? So, um, do Energy CT can distinguish between um, between uh, electron density? It's basically a technique for uh, measuring electron density. So, if you look at a soft tissue deposition that has uh, light atoms, such as uric acid, that has only uh, carbon and hydrogen and so on uh, in it, it will, you will get a different color coding than when you look at something that has um, uh, large atoms, such as calcium. So what you can do is to distinguish between those two, but you cannot distinguish between CPPD, which has calcium, and bone, for example, which has also calcium, or CPPD with calcium and hydroxyapatite deposition disease that has also calcium. That is perhaps not within the possibilities of this technique. So uh, good luck in trying to adjust your uh, dual energy CT uh, post-processing protocols it will probably not work so good. That's a very nice final word, Thorsten, uh, giving advice to another advanced and very knowledgeable, knowledgeable radiologist. Um, so thank you all for attending. Thank you for uh, bringing the spirit of arthritis imaging uh, to your department and uh, to the patients uh, attending your uh, department. and. See you uh, at the next time when we do another webinar or uh, check our uh, app or uh, social channels for more information. Thank you and see you soon. Bye-bye.